Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today I'm very happy to welcome to this radio program Kat Bohannon to talk about her book. Hi there. Hello, to talk about your book, Eve, How the Female Body Drove 200 Million Years of Evolution. Now, Kat Bohannon, my, I understand you're a researcher and a theorist that specializes in evolution and narrative cognition. And, no, narrative and cognition, those are two different things. Uh, actually, are they? they are they they're they're undergirding uh, similar processes. So there's this whole thing in cognitive psychology called narrative cognition, which is um, both how one apprehends story, but also how cognition in some ways may be uh, deeply narrative in the human mind. Um, but narrative and cognition, then, you know, these are technical things. Yes, you did fine. This is fine. This is beautiful. Well, that, that that does interest me, though. When we say narrative, are we basically talking story? How we understand the we world are. and stories? Absolutely. Absolutely, we are. And what I did for my PhD was build some models. I wrote a bunch of computer programs uh, and then analyzed a bunch of data. Uh, but what I was really interested in is building a working model for why narrative in long form narrative, so longer stories work to help you remember stuff, work as a mnemonic, yeah? We have some models of that in CogPsych, which have a lot to do with what the story's about, but not baseline event perception, which is something I was more interested in and how we segment out events and build predictive models and how that plays into what we do and don't remember from a story. So that's what I was doing. I'm interested in the stuff that comes in many ways before language and undergirds a lot of how language works in the brain. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And that's interesting to me. I didn't mean to even start here, but here we are. Uh, because, <laughs> here we are. You Hi. Know, <laughs> you know, working in radio, talking to a lot of people about stories. I, I've thought a lot about mm. stories over time and how important stories are to people. They're just not entertainment. We, we, we learn from stories. We love according to a story. We hate according to a story. I mean, it, it's very human to have, have a story connected to it. And, and I, I don't know, this might be an off the wall question and we're going to get right back into Eve here in a moment, which is in its own yeah, story, sure. which is in its own story of telling the evolution through the, the, the woman's body. Um, do other species have stories? Or narrative? Um, I think what we call story is so often language dependent, although of course you can have story through a visual medium or other mediums, right? So the word story for us at this point in the English language means a hell of a lot of different things, right? Um, but I would say that the cognitive underpinnings of what our brains do when they apprehend story definitely predate our species. That's come in way before. Like lots and lots of different species, especially in higher mammals, have um, causal logic. They can see that there is an agent doing a thing that causes said result afterwards, right? And they will uh, interpret it in a way that they can then mimic that and become their own agent. And that's a very narrativizing thing. That's ordering things over time. That's understanding connections of cause and effect. That's um, uh, placing themselves uh, in an imagined scenario in which they could do that, which is deeply embedded in learning, which is to say there's a lot of the kind of cognition that goes into how we apprehend story that doesn't require you be a human at all. It's just that we are deeply so. We are deeply embedded in this story making and story consuming. And we tell ourselves the story of ourselves uh, as we go through our lives, building on that autobiographical memory, right? Um, one of the funny things that's very true about story, at least in humans in psych, is that you know that you remember stuff better if it's given to you in a story than if it's given to you in, say, a list. This is so replicated in the scientific literature, like it's not even a debatable thing. Yes, narrative is a mnemonic. It helps you remember stuff. Um, but for me, when I was going into my PhD and wanted to do my experiments, I was interested in not only why, but how, the deep mechanisms of, of how that is. And for me, it seems to me that narrative is in many ways one of our first information technologies. Right. And, and um, what it does when we tell a story to one another, it piggybacks on what our stories, what, sorry, what our brains already do to apprehend stories. So we give you information, not in a constant stream, but more like a string of pearls, like more densely emotional emo moments in a story tend to have lots of sensory detail. 
That's when you dig down into the detail, whether on the page or even in the radio, and you set a scene. Yeah, that tends to be where more emotional stuff is happening. And then the kind of less emotional stuff, the detail stuff, the, you know, the asides, they actually time moves quickly in that moment in the story, and you get less sensory detail. And that's what your brain's doing with your own autobiographical memory. That is very interesting. And, and I think even leads <laughs> me into the first planned question that I had for you, which is about elements of our of our own human body that predates the human species. And you mentioned that's interesting, mm -hmm. that narrative predate probably predates human. Uh, narrative human cognition. Species. Narrative yeah. cognition predates human yeah. the human species. I'm going to read a quote from the introduction of your book. Again, it's called Eve, How the Female Body Drove 200 Mil Million Years of Human Evolution. And it's this. It's right in line with this. There's no one mother of us all. Each system in our body is effectively a different age, not only because the cellular turnover rate differs between cell type and location. Your skin cells are far younger than most of your brain cells, for instance, but also because the things we think of as distinct to our species evolved at different times and in different places. We don't have one mother. We have many. And, and as I read that, that does include the hominid evolutionary trajectory of having many mothers, mm -hmm. but it also is before hominids. We have many mothers from other species. Absolutely we do. I mean, that's how evolution fundamentally works. These are the bodies that make the babies, that make the babies, that make the babies. This is what it is to generate generations. Yeah. Um, and so evolution, of course, is working over deep, deep time right? This is working over almost incomprehensible amounts of time. But it's absolutely true that when we diverge in the deep past from one species to another, when we speciate, when we, when we start becoming mammals, or when we're mammals, but then we start becoming placentals, or we're placentals, but we start becoming primates, right? It never happens all at once. It's a stuttery, weird process with lots of dead ends and, and kind of curly cues over time, right? But fundamentally, that's What's happening is that these are the key moments when we become more of what we are now. Quite accidentally. This is not a teleological thing. This is totally accident. But it's absolutely true that there are key moments in our evolutionary path that really drive what our bodies are like now. Placentals. What is that? Mm -hmm. mm. So we, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, do not lay eggs externally. Um, last I checked, although I still maintain that it's a much better idea. And if we could go back to that, please do. Right. So we um, at some point, ancient mammals started lactating, but we were still laying eggs then. But a long many millions of years later, you arrive at the moment where we start gestating our babies inside of our bodies. We females. Yeah. And so that's a moment where just before the uh, asteroid takes out the dinosaurs, uh, very popular moment in our evolutionary past, really upset the birds, right? Now we have, uh, at that moment, we have head and head, the ancestors of marsupials and the ancestors of eutherian placentals, which is like us. Easiest way to remember, marsupials pouch, us, no pouch. So kangaroos and opossums and us, right? We don't know why the asteroid wiped out so many of their ancestors and we did better. It may be that there was something advantageous in the way we do it, or it may have been total accident. We just have no idea. All we know is that they're tucked away in mostly South America and occasionally your North American backyard, and of course Australia, and uh, the rest of the bot, the world, the mammalian world is doing it the way we do, which is having a placenta that uh, docks into the uterus. Uh, it's actually built of both the uterus and the embryonic tissue. It's a weird organ, the only one in the animal world that's made of two beings, effectively. Anyway, and uh, and that's what's holding on and giving resources to the fetus through the course of gestation before it's born. Yeah. J just to be clear, I do know what mm -hmm. a placenta is, but but when we say placental, we, we, we define people yeah. or, or species yeah. by, by, by that? Yeah, actually, it's very, very common in taxonomy, uh, whether you're in the plant world or in uh, animals, to define species by their reproductive organs and or their reproductive behavioral, well, not behavioral, but reproductive traits, effectively. So what uh, a lot of people in the general public may not realize is a deep part of why we are where we are in the taxonomic tree 
is because mammals started reproducing differently. It wasn't simply that the jawbone changed and started forming these funny little bones in the middle ear, which is a thing that's classic in, in mammals. It wasn't just that we started lactating. It was, um, you know, a lot of these traits that make us what we are are deeply tied to how we make babies. And, and this is the, the placenta and placentals are, are important mm -hmm. again because your book, which is called Eve, is, is looking at the female body in evolution. And for mm -hmm. most of the study of evolution, it was focused on the male body. Uh, compare and yeah. contrast for me how one looks and what one sees when they study evolution uh, between the, the male and female body. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, there's the very obvious, um, you know, uh, are you talking more about a, a penis or a vagina for the species who have them? But in the more broader storied sense, you know, in the tradition here of stories, yeah. Um, for example, when we talk about when the asteroid hit and, you know, the massive ash fall and the cooling of the planet and the massive catastrophe that followed around the globe and what that did to the evolution of animals in that moment. Okay. So we often will talk about uh, mammals and how they were good at uh, being warm-blooded and thermoregulating. But now there's an idea that some of the ancestral dinosaur line was too. So, okay. But we talk a lot about diet. We talk a lot about, oh, omnivory was good. It was good to be able to eat a lot of different stuff, especially when your regular food source may well be dead. You know, so we talk about a lot of these things and we talk about male-male competition over the course of evolution. Um, but the really, really big thing in that moment may well have been lactation, that there may have been something very advantageous or useful in being a burrowing animal hiding from the ash fall who was controlling her offspring's water source through her own body, right? Because the big thing about lactation isn't simply that it gives food to a newborn, but that it actually is controlling how that newborn's getting water for that critical, early, vulnerable period of that baby's life, where infection is very much a thing, where predation is very much a thing. In other words, if you can have a way to provide for your offspring in a way that boosts their immunological resistance, in a way that controls how they're getting their water, which is known to carry pathogens and stuff like that. You know, water is inherently a dirty thing in many cases, right? Then that can actually really provide a boost for your, well, for your line, for your, for your species in surviving times of crisis. There are many perks to making milk, turns out, right? But we don't often talk about that because, well, we often talk about the male side of evolution. And I I know some people argue that part of the reason the story is changing is there are so many more uh, women in the sciences now than there were decades ago and prominent voices. And, and likewise, for diversity, that there are so many more brilliant people of color in the sciences than there used to. And I do see that as a factor. Um, but I also think it's simply a kind of um, deeper paradigm shift in the sciences in general. I don't only come up with my ideas because I have boobs. But also, but, you know, and, and likewise for other scientists. I mean, we were so delayed in, in, in our study of human physiology. It was focused oh, yes. on the male. Um, yeah, very, very much so. Very much so. There's such a thing as the male norm. Yeah, absolutely. Which is absolutely why uh, so many drugs that human women take today have never been studied on any female body from um, mouse all the way up through human clinical trials, or if they had, they were often in improperly designed experiments or the data wasn't actually analyzed for sex differences because it wasn't thought to um, matter. Turns out it does matter, very much so, but going back and figuring out what sex differences are really doing to drive um, so many of the differences in our bodies is is a big shift in biology. It's actually, it's like a paradigm shift. Like we're not going to be able to go back to understanding mammals the way we did before. What, what are some of those drugs that were exclusively tested on males that, uh, you know, had sort of unintended consequences for, for women? Uh, there are a number. Um, one of the most uh, dramatic uh, were many of the opioid drugs yeah, so these are common prescription painkillers. It's a big class of drug um, and um, unfortunately often have a very addictive profile. Um, so 
many of these drugs were tested a very long time ago when it was technically uh, against the rules to include women of reproductive age in your clinical trial, in your su subject pool, because uh, once upon a time in the middle of the 20th century, uh, women were enrolled in a uh, clinical trial and took a drug and it gave them birth defects you know, uh, for for their future and present babies, right? And so everyone in the 1970s was like, oh, crap. Okay, we better have some good rules around that. How about we just, unless there's a really good reason, don't enroll women of reproductive age in clinical trials. Unfortunately, that means, um, well, reproductive age is anywhere from like 11 or so until 50 something. So that's that's most of our lives. Yeah. So with the opioid, drug, opioid drugs, um, many of them were tested during this period in which it was discouraged to include females in your clinical trials. But we've now learned after so many things being on the market, including reformulations, that's a thing in pharmaceuticals, that you take an old drug and you reformulate it a little bit and boom, it's a new drug and now it's a prescription and that's just part of how it's done, yeah? But you don't have to go and redo the original clinical trials of the thing you're reformulating. You just have to do a very brief kind of thing to get FDA approval usually. Right, so the FDA again is a good actor here. It's just that for a long time, the rules were don't include women. Now, it turns out, as, as we've now learned, usually by looking at data after the fact, uh, female bodies metabolize opioid drugs differently. Yeah, we tend to need a bit more of them to achieve the same level of pain relief. And so you and the slope at which they leave the body, you know, both that they're metabolized out, you know, peed out usually, and also how they the side effects leave the body, the effects and side effects, uh, just has a different slope. That's just a different rate than it is in male bodies. And unfortunately, while it's true that more men are have opioid addictions in the US right now, um, that's true of most addictions, actually. There is a unique vulnerability to these uh, diseases of despair in the U.S. among, among our, our cis men. But uh, for women, we have a unique vulnerability to opioid addiction because, of course, when we are prescribed such drugs, we often feel that we need more sometimes even more than we've been dis prescribed to achieve the same level of pain, relief, and then we need it sooner than we would expect a re-up as it were to maintain that level of pain relief, which is exactly the sort of thing that makes you vulnerable to addiction. So it isn't so just that's size, a big one. Yeah, it's not just size difference, it's, it's physiological difference. Mm. Exactly, exactly. It's not simply that our bodies are very slightly smaller. And again, only very slightly. Actually, our species, unlike a lot of primates, male and female, roughly the same size compared to like a chimp or others. So it's not simply size difference or how much fat versus muscle, although these are influential factors. It seems to be deeply a story about the liver actually. So these drugs are metabolized usually through the liver. And um, other studies of sex differences in the liver show that human hepatocytes, these are the main cells in your liver, yeah, they express thousands of different genes uh, differently depending on whether or not those cells are XX or XY right? So your liver doesn't have a pronoun, but it does have a sex, very, very likely does. And it is affecting how drugs processed through that liver end up arriving in your bloodstream and uh, end up being processed in various tissues down the line. And of course, how it eventually leaves your body. So the more and more we learn about sex differences in the liver, the more and more clear that there is a moral imperative in making sure we get that right before it lands on the shelves and people start taking them for pain relief. Does this disparity in, in studying, you know, between male and, and female bodies in evolution begin with, with Charles Darwin himself? Uh, some people say so. Uh, I have a lot of love for Darwin. I'll say he was uniquely situated in his time and place, right? And there were many ideas about women and, and what the female might do in that time and place that are, um, let's say, less liberal than they are now. So, uh, but even then, actually, when Darwin released, you know, um, his work, there were actual special women reading groups of Darwin who would meet in secret to read his work because it was considered so illicit that the female might be the choosy member of a species uh, in other animals. In other words, that they might be the ones who are choosing their partners as opposed to the males choosing them. And that was so radical. That was so beyond the sexual mores of the time that there would be groups of women reading almost as if they were reading radical literature to meet 
meet and have their book groups uh, about Darwin's work. Um, and there's just some, some beautiful historical work around how that went down. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Kat Bohannon. Kat Bohannon is the author of the book that we're in conversation about. It's called Eve, How the Female Body Drove 200 Million Years of Human Evolution. You you referenced this earlier, but let me, let me ask more about 200 million years ago with the species that provided milk. And, and you call the, I'm not going to say the, the Latin name. I think it's a Latin name. I'll, I'll let you do that. Uh, but you call this Morgana species, Cadon. <laughs> otherwise known Sorry. as Morgie. Yes. Yes. Uh, Morgie is a wonderful little weasel beast. Um, she is an exemplar genus, actually. So there are lots of species of Morganicodon, um, but the genus is called uh, Morganicodon. And actually, the Smithsonian nicknamed her Morgie. They have it on a little placard in front of her, her in, in down in D.C. And the reason we picked her, and I say we, meaning um, myself and this wonderful paleontologist who helped me pick the eaves, uh, Dr. Advait Jukar, um, who's at the Smithsonian and then did his postdoc at Yale Peabody. He's wonderful. Look him up. He's great. Anyway, um, he and I decided that we really wanted to pick some exemplar eaves that we knew a lot about. Not necessarily that they were our direct ancestors, but that we knew a lot about their bodies and we knew a lot about their environment. And ideally, we might have more than one fossil. And, um, and that it'd be a good way of getting inside what our true ancestor at that time might have been like, because we don't always have that that being named, right? That there's a lot that's inferred. So Morgie, Morgie is wonderful. She lives quite literally under the feet of dinosaurs. She's a burrowing uh, little weaselly thing uh, about the size of a field mouse, uh, about the size of your thumb. And she was an insectivore, so she ate a lot of bugs. But importantly, she's also the moment where we start lactating. We start making milk. And this happens way before we have nipples, by the way, or anything like the human breast, right? The reason that uh, I and other uh, many other women have breasts is, is that we are mammals and we lactate. And uh, all of the other features of these pendulous things that hang off my chest wall uh, come much, much later. And what, what, what was the driver of those? Ooh, um, we're not entirely sure what the driver of all the fatty tissue, the shape of the human breast would be. There are lots of wild theories, some of them much better than others. Um, there was a very bad theory saying, oh, well, it looks kind of like a butt, you know, like if you're, if you're on four legs and you're at eye level with the butt, maybe when you stand up, you can't see the butt anymore. And then the breast starts looking like a butt. This is, this is not a good idea. This is not a good scientific theory. Let me just make that very, very clear. My boobs are here because they look like a butt. That's not what went down. Um, the best theory my, my whole that world heard, view has just been altered. Even if it's not true, uh, I've never thought of it that way. But. <laughs> you know, leave, leave it up to science to give you new ways to yeah. talk about stuff, right? Our boobs like a butt, which really changes, you know, the idea of are you a breast man or a butt man? But anyway, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, I don't know. Both. I'm, it's unclear now. I feel injured by the idea. No, um, I, think, I think the best idea going for why we have the shape we do is that um, our babies are slightly flatter faced than uh, other primates, right? Our nose is kind of squashed up and our forehead's kind of bigger and more bulging comparatively. So it's like our face got squashed, yeah? Now, uh, when you have that kind of face and you're a newborn and you're suckling, you're gonna, if you don't have the right, you know, shape of a breast, you may well have trouble breathing when you're latching onto a nipple. So the idea, a nice paper that I read is that the particular kind of teardrop drop shape breast with this slight upturn to the nipple, not a big one, but slight, uh, may have been advantageous. And I always find those papers really great because instead of asking what the female body might be doing to attract a male, it says, what are the functional features, you know, and that maybe the sexual um, features of it become, come later, right? That fundamentally, we really need to nurse our babies and all of the add-on stuff uh, can indeed then be selected for eventually as a sexually selected trait. But first, maybe let's get the milk in the kid. So function first. Function first is, I, I often find, more compelling. Yeah. yeah. It's not always true. There are sexually selected traits. Um, the human penis is longer than it needs to be. 
uh, and may well be a sexually selected trait. And, and many apologies then for all of those who get it caught in zippers and things. But like, um, that doesn't seem to be particularly great for helping our species reproduce. So the general theory is that it's more like a peacock's tail. It's more like a sexually selected trait that doesn't really need to be there, but may have been used for display at some point. With breastfeeding, th there's a mm -hmm. lot more going on than just feeding. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like I was saying earlier, one of the big things that lactation does is control how you're getting your water. But it also, once you have a nipple on board, and that evolves way later than 200 million years, the assumption is that Morgie did not have nipples, that she was sweating milk out through these special patches in her fur on her abdomen, the way the duck-billed platypus still does. Wow. Those weird little beasts are like sticking their tongues out from between their little weird duck bill and they're licking milk off mom. There's no nipple there right? So once the nipple's on board, though, then what you really have is a two-way communication system between the offspring's body and the maternal body, right? So the formal term for this is upsuck, exactly what it sounds like, the sucking up. So it's the upsuck. And the thing that you get is when a human baby latches on, and this happens in other species too, when you get a human baby latching on, it's forming a kind of docking seal around um, the tissue of the breast, often all the way out at the edge of the areola. It's not just the tip. So, And what it's doing is it's creating a vacuum to suck the milk out of the breast by contracting its cheeks <laughs> right? And that draws the milk out. Now it's actually triggering a letdown reflex. We don't carry a cup of milk around in our boobs when we're nursing. Um, our glands, maybe a tablespoon or two, mostly our glands are, are get on board once the sucking starts. But what happens because the tongue is rolling back and forth in that baby's mouth to help roll the milk down its throat, it's moving the focus of the vacuum back and forth, right? So that's just physics. And when you do that, what you're actually creating is a tide, just like a tide on the shore. So the wave of milk is coming up over the top, down the baby's throat, but then the baby's spit is being sucked in an undertow back under the milk and up into the mother's nipple where it then distributes throughout the breast tissue and all of those tubes and is read like some kind of weird ancient code by this army of immuno agents and sensors who then change the milk for the offspring to suit. So if the baby's sick, then the mother's breast ends up changing the profile of proteins and fats, ends up adding more immunological agents to help the kid fight the infection and sends hormones down the tube too to help soothe the kid so it can get some rest. Right. So you have this two way system between the offspring and the mother when you have a nipple in a lactating mammal. And um, it's one of the most ancient ways we have of communicating with our babies. D does that mean that there's different kind of milk or? It's all milk, but milk is diverse. It's always milk, but the, the ratio of things within that particular brew change day to day, sometimes in response to uh, signals coming from the baby's spit, sometimes in response to signals from the mother at perceiving her environment, like if she's more stressed or not, or she's more hungry or not, or she's in one or another situation, likewise, her milk profile will change a bit. So it is different kinds of milk, but it's all milk. It's all still very much in our species, human milk, no matter what, but it is tailored to suit between the mother and child. Milk is effectively a co-produced biological product. Again, one of the only things like that in the animal world. Do other species have this as well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so Dr. Katie Hind, H-I-N-D-E, she is brilliant. I met her when she was up at Harvard. I think she's in Arizona now. She is an expert in primate milk. And I learned so much just from talking to her and reading her work about uh, monkey milk, especially, but milk in general. She's, she's just wonderful. And I will only offer that one of the key and interesting differences between most primate milk and human milk is that we have a really huge amount of special milk sugars in human milk. Um, and they're called the oligosaccharides. And these things are actually not for the baby to digest. It's not digestible by the human body. They're actually for the bugs in our intestines. They're for the bacteria, they're for our microbiome in, um, in our intestines that help us digest stuff. And so we have a really hugely diverse profile of many different kinds of these special milk sugars that again, are for the 
bugs in the baby's uh, intestines and not for the baby exactly. And it helps that microbiome be more balanced, uh, more friendly, if you like, to our purposes, as opposed to uh, the ones that might cause more harm or more illness. Uh, it helps them gear up because, of course, this microbiome is helping us digest uh, the food that we eat, including at that stage, the milk that the baby is drinking. Um, and it helps fight off those pathogens. Fat is also important, evolutionarily yes. speaking. Yes. And, and men and women have fat in different places of the body. We are among the uh, fattiest newborns of all mammals. You may not realize that. All that cute chub that comes out, uh, that the little rolls you want to pinch, that's actually uh, unusual. Most mammals don't come out quite as fat as we do. We come out about as fat as a newborn baby seal. Um, and we don't entirely know why that is. Uh, that's one of the big debates in the evolution of our species. Because for a long time, we thought it was resilience against varying food stores, right? So if you're born really fatty, maybe it's okay if mom's milk is coming in a little thin, if you like. Sometimes we think of it as an immunological thing. Sometimes we think of it as an insulation thing. Fats for lots of stuff. One of the things that's really interesting um, as a theory that's out there for uh, human women's fat, or specifically our gluteofemoral fat, so that's our the fat on our butts, the fat on our upper thighs, and the fat on our hips, is that it functions a little bit differently than other fat depots in the body. It stores these special lipids called LCPUFAs, long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, these are fats, these lipid chains, that we're actually kind of bad at just making from other bits of stuff in our bodies. So we get most of it from our diet. In other words, if you eat something that has them, then that's where you're getting them for the most part, right? And the thing about those fatty acids is that they seem specially stored in these fat depots in the female body, and they are metabolically protected. You know, you may have heard first place to gain, last place to lose around a, a woman's butt. Maybe you haven't, but uh, I think maybe some of your women listeners, uh, cis women listeners have heard that. So it actually is basically true. It's metabolically protected. So we load all of this stuff into our thighs and hips and butts. And then when we hit the third trimester, when we do, if we do become pregnant, it seems to be just like hoover down in through the placenta into the newborn's body, building up that kid's fat stores and help helping build its brain and retina, and then building up the fat stores for that long period of lactation when it's also kind of specially mobilized and utilized. And the best theory going for why that is that I've seen is that um, these fatty acids are really important for building brains and eyeballs. Well, brains and retinas specifically, which is to say my fat butt might have evolved, um, well, to help make babies, should I do so? And to help make brains, which are big, right? And, and powerful. Specifically, not just big and powerful, but metabolically incredibly costly. It's, a, it's some of the most expensive tissue in your body. Think of it like a sports car that just happens to live in your head. It's just as buggy as a sports car, that's for sure. But also it takes a lot of gas to run and a lot of uh, energy and money effectively to maintain, right? The human brain, we like it, but it's kind of a problem, right? But it takes a lot of these special fatty acids to build, actually, because they're involved in quite a lot of the structure in there. Something I found really interesting that I'd like to talk about is you, you suggest that the human species historically may be less prone to rape than, than other species. And mm -hmm. I, I'm a birder, uh, so I've seen mm -hmm. it. <laughs> I've, I've seen it. And this isn't to downplay rape. Obviously, rape happens within the human species as well. Um, very much so. As a birder, I've watched mallards, which are sort of oh, very God. violent in 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 uh, reproduction and procreate. And, and you'll you'll see two male mallards sort of fighting it out, really on top, and even f abusing the the female uh, mallard. And my understanding is that mallards have very specialized penises and vaginas and and they're both mm -hmm. been sort of weaponized in this evolutionary race and that female mallards actually have a very specialized vagina that's able to keep um penetration happening from from an, a male mallard that it doesn't want it to penetrate and and, and if you compare that to our genitalia yeah. ours is very mm -hmm. straightforward and, and simple i suppose 
Um, yes. I mean, as a bisexual person, I have a longstanding relationship with a variety of men, and I'm fond of them. But it is true that the human penis is comparatively kind of boring. Not a lot of bells and whistles there. Not a lot of uh, elaborate physiological features. So ducks, yeah, um, full trigger warning, ducks are incredibly rapey. Uh, gang rapey, unfortunately, often it's true that sexual coercion is a major part of many duck species, especially mallards. Um, and uh, the thing about that elaborate vagina, that sort of labyrinthine vagina that the uh, female duck has is that it, it can close off little pockets. Sadly, she can't prevent penetration. Mm. Um, so that is, that's still, and I'm very sad to say, happening. Um, and I'm sure all female ducks would like for that to stop when they don't want it to. But the animal world doesn't care what we feel about it, right? So, um, but what she's able to do for an undesired partner is she's able to kind of close off a little pocket to trap the unwanted semen uh, and associated sperm. Yeah. And then when she's finally left alone, uh, she's able to uh, kind of open it out and expel it. Sometimes she'll even use her beak to kind of help that along, pecking at the lower. But for the most part, she's able to get rid of it. But for a desired partner, she's able to open up a passageway to the egg and let the desired partner then fertilize. Right. But of course, you know, the male body in this long, very sexy cold war of these genitalia trying to be advantageous to their owners uh, isn't going to take that lying down. So he's now evolved a very elaborate corkscrew like penis um, that is uh, effectively trying to work around this uh, countermeasure that the female body has long evolved. And so it's not that he's never successful. It's just he's much less successful than he would have been had she not do you see? Now, this is happening over deep time. It's not like a duck woke up and had an idea one day, right? That this is this is a body morphing in deep time because that much sexual coercion, that much duck rape had been going on for that long to then uh, make it advantageous for the female to evolve as she did, and then the male as well. We always have to remember that the penis and the vagina evolve uh, together. They co-evolve, right? Because they are what they are. Now, the thing about the human penis being um, boring, again, compared to other animals, um, you know, just, just physiologically speaking, is that if we were a species that had a history of a lot of sexual coercion, you should expect to see the way that, say, the mallard duck has, I mean, over deep, deep time, you know, you would expect to see a number of different physiological signals um, from perhaps more bells and whistles on our, in our genitalia, uh, perhaps more evidence of male-male competition in male bodies, like do you have big fangs, big eye teeth, which are generally used in male-male competition to threaten one another? Do you have um, many of the things that chimpanzees do to uh, compete with one another? Um, and, and the answer is no, actually. We have a fairly straightforward vagina and a remarkably straightforward, uh, boring penis. And we also have a lot of evidence along the hominin line of a reduction in male-male competition, right? Um, both in the genitalia and elsewhere in the body. And so for me, and this is in the last chapter of the book, I was trying to see if there was evidence of one kind of mating strategy or another in our past. Because the thing about science is that um, there's always going to be bad actors who want to weaponize science to tell a story that they already want to tell about what is or isn't, you know, quote, natural for us. And one of the unfortunate stories that we tell about cis men and boys is that somehow they are innately rapists or sexual coercion people, that somehow it's just natural and society then works against some innate instinct. Now, I don't actually believe that to be true for many reasons, both personally, but also scientifically, right? Because we're not showing evidence of that being a dominant mating strategy in our bodies, in our evolutionary past, at least what we know about that in other animals, right? Some more related to us like primates and some less like ducks, but of what we know about what bodies do, if a lot of rapiness, if a lot of sexual coercion is going down, we don't have those cues in our bodies. That doesn't mean that we aren't doing horrible things to one another. That doesn't mean that women and girls everywhere in the world are horrifically suffering because of sexual abuse and, and, and things like rape. It, and their, su their suffering absolutely matters. But what we can do is we can stop telling that story about how what the male is doing is just natural, right? That actually 
we didn't necessarily evolve, evolve with that as the dominant pattern. Why, why do you think that is that we didn't evolve with that as the dominant pattern? Well, I mean, now I'm moving strongly into conjecture. Um, yeah. But so I'll just put a pin in that and flag it for you. I think um, a lot of the stories that are told in the sciences around human mating strategies in deep time, all the way back to hominids, is, yes, this reduction in male-male competition. But the reason for it is always up to debate. Some people want it to be more like King Solomon and his many wives. Maybe we were doing more like what gorillas do. Because gorillas have male-male competition, but they're not competing actively for sperm. So on the one hand, they develop these really big bodies compared to females. Uh, you know, the beat your chest kind of giant and, the, and female gorillas are fairly small. But their balls are really small because actually when you have a lot of uh, in promiscuity, you actually need to make a lot of sperm because your sperm are literally in competition with other sperm in any given female because she's having, that's what chimps do. Chimps have gigantic testicles, just massive knockers down there. But gorillas have teeny little balls, kind of like peanuts, not a lot going on there. So those are both kind of signals. And when you look at our body, we're we're kind of a medium bald primate. You know what I mean? It's like not too, kind of Goldilocks, not too big, not too small. So the argument is usually like maybe, maybe we were promiscuous, but not like a chimp. Maybe we did, we definitely weren't like harems. We don't have a body that looks like, like one guy and many females, poly, polygyny. That doesn't seem to be the thing. So usually the argument is that we moved more towards monogamy. Uh, which is to say, uh, you had paternal certainty, uh, males knew who the father was, you know, and the females were largely mated for life. One assumes cheating in all directions, male and females, but for the most part, right, that we became a more monogamous species and our bodies um, evolved in such a way over time. There are good arguments for that. That may well be the case. Um, but I make the argument in the book that that may not have been the greatest um, deal for the female when that shift happened. Is does this get us into then a patriarchal structure? So it's always tricky because we always have that tempting thing to say that maybe with the way the world looks now in many human societies is the way we were. Yeah. And, um, Sorry, I was having a little technical difficulty. I'll say again. There's always the difficulty of comparing what human beings do now to what we assume our ancestors may have done. We're very genetically closely related to chimps and bonobos, equally to both. Um, bonobos are sort of the, the peace nick of the chimps, if you like. They are the, uh, well, they have a lot of sex, actually, and, and that's how they resolve their conflicts. And so a lot of people like to talk about them, our, our peace nick uh, cousins. But of course, there's been a very long time since we were, you know, we, since the last common ancestor, right? So there's only so much that you can know. I'm, I'm taking a while to answer this question because I think a lot of how we talk about the patriarchy, you know, now, which is a big idea. It's a big story. And it's a lot about how we talk about male dominance in society and institutionalized sexism and, you know, and, and what it means to be patriarchal is a very, very modern ideas are woven into our understanding of that. But I can tell you that the chimpanzee is male dominated. Yeah. And that the bonobo is not. The bonobo is a matriarchy. Uh, the females are effectively in charge, and the chimpanzee is a patriarchy in the primate sense, not in our big evolved human sense, but in the primate sense, uh, anciently, uh, with the males in charge. Yeah. And there are big, big differences between their societies. One of the biggest differences is that in the matriarchal bonobo society, female bonds are incredibly strong, right? The way we talk about sisterhood doesn't really quite even compare to how tightly bonded um, in that social network a female bonobo is. And there are many perks to that. And then there are also some not great perks to that. Um, but uh, how, how we became patriarchal isn't exactly clear. We just know that as soon as we started offering males paternal certainty, there is a way of then establish, establishing a lineage of male power that simply wasn't possible before. So in the primate world, um, there are princesses 
and there can be princes, but only briefly, but there aren't really princes in the way we think of them. So the only way you know for sure who the dad is in a mixed promiscuous society like a chimpanzee or the bonobo uh, is if those two are then separated out and just live together forever, right? Um, it's, it's, it's simply not possible, right? In fact, par- one of the arguments for why they have as much sex as they do is that there is always the danger of infanticide. Yeah, that babies are murdered all the time by other females and by other males. But there is an argument for maybe holding back if you're not sure if the kid's yours. Well, yeah. Also, collective, um, take, you have a collectively, you're also going to take care of all the kids, right? Because they also might be yours. Ooh, uh, yes. And there is some allo parenting. Um, this uh, is drawing on Sarah Hurdy's work, HRDY. Um, so there is some allo parenting in chimpanzee and bonobo some and that means that you help take care of offspring that are not directly genetically related to you um but uh the human species took that and ran with it all the way to china i mean we do allo parenting like whoa we adopt regularly we have whole communities that help raise our kids but the big thing about moving to paternal certainty which is to say being exclusive with one partner is that it opens up your offspring to infanticide with in ways that may not have been possible before. Yeah. Um, and so that means that a switch to monogamy is actually very costly to a female. Um, the other thing that is useful to think about patriarchies and matriarchies is that we are among the only species that has gynecology and midwifery. We regularly help each other give birth. That doesn't happen in the chimpanzee. Like at all really no that's not a thing in fact what they do is they take what's called a maternity leave jane goodall called it that you know where uh, when they give birth when a female gives birth she leaves the troop and goes and secretly gives birth and takes a while before she reintroduces her newborn to the group and the reason that she does that is because the alpha female if she's not friends with the alpha female uh may well kill the kid as a, as an act of competition and not just kill it, but actually then eat it in front of her. It's horrific. Nobody wants to live in that society, right? So to arrive at midwifery, you have to have something more like a matriarchy, I think. I think you have to be more like the bonobo, where you have these really tight female bonds, where everyone trusts each other in that sense between the females, and you trust other females not to harm your child. So I'll, I'll end with a big question here. We're almost out of time, but I think this question has to be asked after after that great explanation is then what what do you think we are naturally as as a human species is is sort of a patriarchal order, something more that's within culture and not natural or how do you it's a big question. How do I resolve I, I, maybe that I should have so started. Many. Maybe I should have mm. started with that question, but yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I definitely don't think I'm going to solve sexism here on the radio. But I can say, at least from what biology can can show us, that what the human species is, is deeply a culture maker. We are constantly innovating around our cultures and our cultural rules and what we do within those cultural sets. And um, there are many, many historical uh, and present, but mostly historical cases of matriarchies in human culture. And there are likewise many, many cases of patriarchies in human culture. So we should never assume in a species that's 300,000 years old that we know exactly what most of us were doing 300,000 years ago. Yeah. I would say at the very least that there are known detriments to patriarchies, but there are known detriments to matriarchies too. Absolutely the case. In the case of primate matriarchies, there is a lot of violence. Dominance is not a good combination with violence, right? And that in many primate matriarchies, the females can be incredibly violent. Um, maybe I'm just very American about it, but I kind of like the idea of egalitarianism. I kind of like the way we do it where we're trying to move away from one or another group being hideously dominant over other groups. And I don't think any one culture in the world today has the answer for how best to go about it. Um, But we're collaborating more in our culture making than we ever have before. And that can only be a good thing. And and it gets us back to narrative, right? If we're talking about culture. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. It absolutely does. Kat Bohannon, I've enjoyed our conversation very much and I thank you. Thank you for having me on. This was fun. Kat Bohannon has been our guest. Again, she has joined us to talk about her book called Eve, 
how the female body drove 200 million years of human evolution. <laughs>